Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. Still have my cinnamon in my coffee. It's a good morning, and I'm finding a lot of good information today. <clears throat> and I want to start with this. This is a tweet from Marcus Treacher um, from Ripple. Ripple over Swift, Euro Exim Bank starts using X Rapid for cross-border payments after a transaction gets lost on the on Swift. Now, I've told you about Euro Exim Bank and how they're going to use X Rapid. We've talked about that. But this is the first time I've seen this twist on, on why they went with Ripple and XRP. And it's extremely ex significant um, for you and for me as XRP holders because these guys are literally switching over from Swift and they are the first domino to fall. And if you think that this will not cause a cascading effect, you would be wrong because that's all it takes is one bank that that, that Euro XM bank uh, competes with that all of a sudden can't compete with them in cross-border transactions. And it is over. But anyway, this article talks about, now Graham Bright is the head of compliance and operations at the bank, at Euro XM bank. Um, and here's what, here's basically what the, the, the part of this article that's so interesting um, and then I'll show you something else interesting as we lead into this. The, it, they said the current standard for international payments in the traditional SWIFT system has been used for decades. 11,000 banks and financial institutions across the globe are currently still using it. SWIFT is blamed by Bright, who says that there is a stringent need for a change in, t in technology. He said that one of the bank's transactions got lost this month on the SWIFT network, and this is the main reason for which it's time to move on to better and safer products, such as the tech used by Ripple. It was lost somewhere in the quagmire of a central organization, and we have no visibility on where it is. All the counterparty says is, we have not received your message. Now think about that, folks. That that one example of one person working for one bank says everything you need to know about what kind of an investment you are sitting on in XRP. So you just sit tight and just block out all the noise and enjoy the ride because the world is about to change and we were here first. So you ought to give yourself a pat on the back because we got some fun times ahead. Okay. Now, let's keep talking about SWIFT here for a second. This, we saw a few, this was back on December 12th. SWIFT CEO steps down after era of tech disrupting global banking. And it didn't say why the guy was stepping down. And then this came out this last week. Paris FinTech Forum, which is coming up in the next few days, you're, they're gonna have um, a, a forum about sending money and Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, and the guy who's stepping down as CEO of Swift but is still currently their CEO are going to be speaking. And I don't know if it's going to be a debate format or what, but what an interesting dynamic that this is going to be. Because I don't see if you're Swift, how on earth. Of course, I know what the approach is going to be. It will have to be. It'll have to be an approach of conference, confidence and almost arrogance. Kind of like what we saw with Blockbuster when Netflix came along. So I hope that uh, Swift takes a page. There was also a little bit of arrogance um, with retailers towards Amazon when Amazon told everyone they were going to sell things on the Internet and everyone laughed at them. So stick to your guns, Swift. Have fun with that. Uh, moving along. This is a, is a really good article from Abacus Journal on uh, Goldman Sachs. And I want to, this is, this is exciting stuff, folks. These guys um, at the Abacus Journal, I asked them, just so you know, I asked them for proof because they kept quoting sources that they had. And I was given proof without getting, I was not given any names uh, of who they're doing, but I was given um, 
I was given cards where I can see that they actually do have the sources at these places that they say they have sources at. And for that reason, I go over these articles. Um, and this is interesting because the whole theme of what I've been talking about for the last nine months or so is that what you see in the, in the articles and all the things that are trying to scare you and what's going on behind the scenes are two different things. And so you have to keep your eye on what's important. And that's the, the positive things that we know are going on. And that's why we stay focused on those things. This is from this article about Goldman Sachs. This is them speaking. Speaking with two sources at Goldman Sachs who are facilitators in the OTC markets and aware of Goldman's ability to broker transactions, it is clear that Bitcoin has begun to resonate with investors as digital gold. One source had this to say, understand that Goldman, Sachs, Goldman banks a huge portion of ultra high net worth families that trust the firm to make the right calls. Those families have seen Goldman invest in Circle and other Bitcoin related firms and are increasingly comfortable with the digital currency. The narrative that it, that is Bitcoin is digital gold has begun to take hold in the minds of investors. This has led to increased volumes late in 2018 and throughout the beginning of 2019. And if the global economy continues to soften, expect those volumes to continue to increase. The second source we spoke to over the weekend said the following. OTC volumes have increased across the board. Global economic uncertainty and flight to safety now includes Bitcoin. That is why you are seeing an increase in volume year over year and again to start 2019. Goldman is a major player here. They've got, a fir they've got first mover privileges at Circle because of their equity stake in the firm. So they are more effective from a pricing standpoint than other la large bank facilitators. Their clients know this and it breeds confidence in the firm as a safe place to funnel investment dollars into digital assets. Several media outlets have published OTC volumes ranging in the billions on a daily basis and in, in the feedback amongst those in the know, in the know quotes, regarding Goldman's involvement would echo those numbers. OTC trading has begun to significantly outpace exchange volumes as large investors, whales, increasingly prefer to trade with a perceived air of invisibility while avoiding pushing the markets one way or the other. Speaking to a crypto focused firm in New York late last week, they commented on, on the strength of their BTC OTC operations and its growth over the past 90 days specifically increased volume in the buy side. And it isn't just ultra high net worth individuals doing the buying. Shadow crypto trading desks at firms like State Street, Morgan Stanley, etc., are buying BTC in volume as well. They're simply stopping short of drafting press releases to tell the world about it. As the tail of the bear market lengthens, smart money sees BTC as an accumulation opportunity. Don't be surprised once the regulatory framework in the U.S. is sufficiently clear if these firms begin to disclose the breadth and depth of their involvement, of involvement in the crypto space. It may surprise all of us. And all they're saying here, folks, is what, when they say once the regulatory framework is, is in place, well, all they're really saying is once all of their all of their Wall Street sponsored crypto exchanges like Bact and Fidelity Digital Assets are ready to go, which will come right along with, okay, we've gotten regulatory approval. Once that happens, it'll be too late because then the floodgates will open and they are that that's when they're going to turn to all the people. Remember, I've told you in the past when I was at Morgan Stanley, listen to this. When I was at Morgan Stanley, they you would have uh, initial public offerings of companies. And the way it worked was only the wealthiest of the clients with Morgan Stanley would have first dibs on those IPOs. And so that's the way the world has worked forever. If you have more money, you have access to get to the front of the line. And then once you've parked your investment, that's when they go to all the average Joe retailers and say, okay, now you, you can, we're, we're now offering this 
and it hits the public markets, hits Wall Street. Well, the wealthy people, they've already gotten in. They're already there. That is what's been going on in 2018 and continues to go on now. But what's interesting about digital assets is this is the first time that for the savvy ones of us, for those that have gone and you know, you and I know what we've had to go through to park our money. We've had to open a Coinbase account and a this account and a that a coin account and move the money and get it here and eventually find our way into XRP. We've had to do it the hard way. We've had to deal with banks that don't want us to buy crypto. But for those of us that figured out how to get in and then figured out how to protect our digital assets and store them safely while we wait, we will be the ultimate winners because we are we are in a spot that puts us even before the wealthy, even before these people that are going through Goldman Sachs right now. We were here first. And for that reason, we are at a point in history. We are making history. This is the this is the first time in history that those of us who are we're average Joes, but we're a little smarter than the rest of the average Joes. We figured it out. We were ahead of them. We're in the 1% of the 1%. This has not happened in history. In history has always, the, the, the rewards have always gone to the wealthy of the wealthy first. And then if we're lucky enough, or if we spotted something lucky enough down the line, we would get a chance at the opportunity. Um, so anyway, moving along, I wanted to show you this. Now, what's happening at the same time with all of this? I've been telling you for the last year, back during the dot-com boom, we saw you couldn't look, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing a dot-com commercial. You couldn't ride on the bus in New York without seeing a dot-com commercial. Everybody you knew was not just familiar of dot-coms, but they were investing in dot-coms. To put that in perspective, Right now, you and I know what it's like to go to a dinner party and talk about Bitcoin or digital assets. We get laughed at even now. We will be the last ones to laugh. But right now, it's so great that we're getting laughed at still. And the reason, if we were not getting laughed at and everybody to your left and to your right was not only knowledgeable about digital assets but owned them the way it was at the height of the dot-com bubble, then it would be too late. But because be thankful that you're being laughed at and that they think you're stupid and that you don't know what you're talking about. Be thankful. That's a gift because this is what's forming in the background. Look at this. This is a soccer game. Soccer is not that popular over here in the United States. It's getting more popular, but um, soccer is probably the most pop. It is the most popular sport in the world. They call it football over in Europe. And this is, I'm assuming, this is this is from Madrid, a Madrid, real Madrid game. Well, look at this: first regulated crypto and digital stocks exchange, DX exchange. So it begins, folks. You're going to see before this is over. Not only will you be wrapped in advertising and and Super Bowl commercials from digital asset companies and digital assets that are being promoted. Not only will you see that. But you'll look to the left and to the right and your friends and family, not only will they not be laughing at you, but they will own those digital assets and they will be calling you a genius because you saw it and the sheep finally figured it out. And so that's where we're at. I want to finish this video to make a point to a lot of you. Some of you are new to this channel and I've, I've told people on this channel several times, I have a six year old and I've got a one that's 12 going on 13. For whatever reason, I decided to make baseball a big part of their lives. But the main reason I wanted to make baseball a big part of their lives is I thought that it would be a bonding thing, but also, and more importantly, I have taken baseball as a way to show my sons how to succeed in life in general. About, uh, when my son was seven years old, my, my oldest, when he was seven years old, my mother-in-law gave me an article about Freddie uh, Freeman and how Freddie Freeman had grown up. Freddie Freeman, who is, the, in my opinion, he's one of the best hitters in baseball. He plays for the Atlanta Braves. Well, Freddie Freeman, has a, his mother died of cancer, skin cancer, when he was a young boy. 
And his father, who was an accountant, would take lunch breaks and he would take Freddie Freeman to hit baseballs. And they and Freddie Freeman talks about uh, how he as it was kind of a bonding thing. And they would go and hit hit baseballs every day at noon. And he said he did that his whole life. Well, this is a video that I've shown my sons and where Freddie Freeman lays out exactly how he prepares for a game. Well, since my, young, since my oldest was seven, and then when my youngest turned five, we started him. Both of these kids, one from seven and one from age five, they have hit three bu uh, two buckets of balls three days a week, year round, not just during baseball season. But I've done that with them to illustrate the, one of the most important principles of life, and that is persistence. That if you want to be the best at anything, you have to be more persistent than anyone and work harder than anyone at it. I don't care what it is, what what it's what thing it is, whether you're trying to become a doctor or, or a lawyer or whether you want to be the best magician in the world. Persistence is what will make you better than, than everybody else. All this biz, business about people being a natural at this or a natural at that, uh, those guys, that might be a one in a, in a million, but the rest of them just worked at it harder over a long period of time than anyone else. I don't care what example you take, whether it's Tiger Woods or the best baseball player or the best golfer or whatever, best doctor, that guy worked at it harder than anyone else. And he was studying while everybody else was partying. Well, this is my favorite time of year to illustrate this point to my sons. And the reason is because we're going into baseball season right now. And I'm, I'm telling you all this because I know there's a lot of young people that listen to this and I'm going to get, I'm going to give you one of the greatest pieces of advice that my father ever gave me. I've given it before, but I like to continually give that on this channel because it's one of the most important things you can ever learn in your life. About this time of year, um, and I took my sons yesterday down to the field, down to the cages, and there's also baseball fields around, and I took them down to the cages that I take them to all the time. Anytime we don't have time to go to the, to the actual facility to hit baseballs, we go down to the cages where all the fields are. Well, during the year, as we're doing this in the off season, there's no, nobody to be found anywhere around there. Well, yesterday we went down there because two weeks from now, there will be a tryout and baseball season will begin. And what do you know? There are dads and their sons and they're all out there playing baseball. They're in the cages. They're out there on the fields. I use this as a teachable moment every year with my sons. I tell them to look at those fathers and look at those sons. Those fathers, they want their sons to be the best. They want their sons to be all stars. And a lot of them will be very angry when it doesn't happen for them. But I tell my sons every year, I say, now look at them. You have not seen them all year out here. You've been out here putting your, doing, taking your swings. You've hit two buckets each three times a week all year. And, and they've been nowhere to be found. And now they show up in the seventh inning and they want to be good and they want their sons to be good and they want to tell their friends how good their sons are at baseball. Well, that's just how life works. 99.9% .9 of the population approach life exactly like those dads do with their sons. It's the, it's the 0.1% of the population that does what I'm teaching my sons to do. Those are the people that are the top 0.1% of the successful people in the world. They work harder than everybody else. When everybody else is playing and talking about how they want to do things, these are the people that are going at it and they're working and they're being persistent and they don't stop. They don't give up. They do it around the clock year round. And that goes for anything. If you want to be the best doctor, heart doctor in the history of the world, then you're going to study more, read more, learn more about being a heart doctor than anyone else. And you're going to take it more seriously and you're going to go at it harder than anyone else. You're not going to show up the night before the exam in medical school and, and try to study and, and crash study the night before um, and then go past the test. 
the guy who's going to be the greatest heart surgeon in the history of the world is going to be the guy that's been studying all along while the other guy was out drinking at the bar and then decides to study very hard the night before or the week leading up to the exam. That's how life works. But most of the population, 99.99% of the population is not willing to put in the work and is not willing to do what I'm trying to teach my sons to do. And this is the quote that my father gave me a long time ago. It's the greatest quote probably I've ever read. This is what life's all about. And you should print it out, put it on. You should look at it and read it every day. I make my sons read this quote. My dad made me memorize it when I was growing up. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. That's Calvin Coolidge that said that. And that is one of the core principles of life. 99 point. Think about this as you approach life, young people out there and older people. 99.9% .9 of the people that you compete with in everything that you do, whether it's your livelihood or sports or anything else, are not willing to put in the work. They want to show up right before the game and then they want to be good. But what kind of sacrifices are they willing to put up with in order to become good? Ask any Olympic level athlete what kind of sacrifices they made growing up to become an Olympic athlete. How many things that they had to forego, fun things, in order to achieve what they achieved. So it all comes down to how important is success. Well, I'm trying to build into my sons, and you should think the same way. You should build into yourself or your sons or your kids and grandkids that what it takes to be a success. Because it's not just going to happen. Um, Hollywood likes to fantasize things. like They make the movie, one of my favorite movies, The Natural, um, with uh, Robert Redford about uh, this baseball player who's a natural. Well, for the rest of us, for 99%, for most of the population, yes, some guys are born to run faster or throw faster, but those guys are one out of a million. For the rest of us, it's hard work and persistence. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that it's all about persistence. Thank you for listening.